people who know our ministry and attend our studies all know what we do that's different, what I do that's different. And in a word, it's the in-depth teaching. It's, it's going into things most people don't think to want to talk about. And that's what I think is needed. So we go out of our way to do that. I'm saying this because tonight will be a good example of that. It would be very easy to give the high points on what's in chapter 15 and move on. And many of you would probably have been very content with that. But there is a lot more in 15 than you might expect. And as a result, I'm going to take you through it. The challenge for me is to do it in a way that you can follow. Because we're going to get into some things that are, are pretty tough. They're detailed. They go into a lot of other areas of Scripture. We're actually going to go back into some things we talked about in Revelation. So there is some detail here that's worth our time. I think you'll agree. But I want to just set up that expectation coming in tonight that this is, this is sort of what we do at Verse by Verse Ministry. And it may not be what everybody wants every time, but you can't help that. You're here and you can't say anything about it. So I think you'll enjoy it. Let's go to Scripture, but let's go to prayer first. Father, guide us in this study tonight. We ask the Spirit... Uh, would be attentive to helping our minds grasp this material. The Spirit would draw us into it in a way that we can understand it. Give us uh, memories, Father, to hold on to it so that when the time is right, you could reveal it to us in an even fuller way. Let us appreciate the wisdom and the depths of it. And most of all, Father, I I ask that with what we'll study, with what we'll see tonight, with the uh, immense complexity of what you do in your Word, it will stir us to have a greater awe and respect and and seek a a greater knowledge of your word because of what it shows us about who you are and about your wisdom and power and strength. And let the word, Father, just draw us toward you in that way so that we become even more confident that this is not a work of men but the work of the Creator. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, as we go into chapter 15, we have two verses we want to cover out of chapter 14. We, We did read these verses last week, but we really gave very little time to them. I wanted to use them as a launching point tonight into chapter 15. So go with me to chapter 14 of Exodus, verse 30 and 31 will be where we start. At the point where we left off last week, we watched the video, of course, we looked at the nation crossing the Red Sea, they've escaped Pharaoh, they've escaped Egypt. And just as God promised to Abraham some 400 years earlier, they are now out of Egypt. They've crossed the Gulf of Aqaba, they've entered into Midian, as we discovered last time we met. And as they stand on the other shore, they look back, they watch the destruction of the Egyptian army in the waters. So at the end of chapter 14, Moses summarizes that moment for us. And the last two verses give us that summary. In verse 30, thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord. And they believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. Moses says, Israel saw the destruction of Egypt, feared God, and believed in the Lord and in Moses. Now that testimony sounds really encouraging. And if you hadn't read ahead in the Pentateuch, in the next books of Moses, you might have thought that this was a wonderful testimony to the faithfulness of Israel. But such is not the case. According to the Psalms, written obviously far later in history, the psalmist writes this in Psalm 106. Verse 4 is where we start in Psalm 106. This is a retelling by the psalmist of this same time, this same moment, the Exodus. And he says in verse 4 of 106, Remember me, O Lord, in your favor toward your people. Visit me with your salvation, that I may see the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. We have sinned like our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have behaved wickedly. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember your abundant kindnesses, but rebelled by the sea, at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them, for the sake of his name, that he might make his power known. Thus he rebuked the Red Sea and it dried up. He led them through the deep as through the wilderness. So he saved them from the hand of the one who aided them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them was left. Then they believed his words. They sang his praise. They quickly forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. 
So what Israel saw and what they believed was not what it first might have appeared to be. Because the psalmist tells us that the people rebelled at the Red Sea. Now that refers to before they crossed, where they stood at the Red Sea and they were telling Moses, why did you send us out here to die? They had already seen the wonders of God in Egypt even before that point, right? And then they saw what happened in the Red Sea. The Lord, we're told, rescued them through the Red Sea. It says, not for their sake, but for his own name's sake. What that means is that the work of God in the course of that salvation through the Red Sea, that is, the salvation of their lives from Pharaoh, he did that because he promised Abraham he would do that. And the Lord was not going to allow Israel to perish in that moment, for if he had done so, though they may have been deserving of it for their unbelief, Nevertheless, it would have meant the Lord had gone against his own word and he would have besmirched his own name. He's not going to do that. So his highest priority is his glory and his name among nations. And he does all things for that sake. And all that happens in creation is directed toward that end. And when Israel stood on the seashore and rebelled, God had the intent to go forward with his plan despite their unbelief because of his name's sake. And then it says in Psalm 106 verses 12 and 13, They saw the works of that Red Sea crossing. They believed his words. They sang his praise. But then in verse 13, then they quickly forgot his works. Now, if you read further into the psalm, and if you read, of course, in other places of the Old Testament, you know where that's going. You know what it's a reference to. It's to the rebellion in the desert, to the 40 years of wandering, to the 10 times they test God, which ultimately leads to his judgment against them that they would not enter the promised land. That generation would not enter the promised land. So God's actions in saving these people and their response in the moment is not necessarily, and clearly is not by Scripture, a response of a believing heart. You see God save men. Those actions are always based on what produces the greatest glory for His name. That is always God's purpose in His salvation. And this is true whether He does it here physically or whether he does it to us by faith spiritually, I've said about myself many times, God didn't save me because he looked around in heaven and said to himself, this place just won't be heaven without Steve up here. So his purpose in saving me is not about me and my needs or even my merit. It's only about his glory. And somehow in his eternal plan across the eons of time and the space of creation itself, there is somehow some marginal improvement in glory for his name by saving me than there would have been if he had not saved me. But it has nothing to do with me. It's in how he chooses to use me. It's how he may turn that to good in some other way. The same is being said about Israel here. For his own name, they are being saved. Throughout the story of Israel in the desert, this theme repeats itself. The people of Israel are portrayed repeatedly as disobedient and unbelieving and as ones who test the Lord's patience and goodness. The writer of Hebrews, as you probably know, sums this up best when he refers back to this generation that wandered in the desert in Israel. And he says this in Hebrews 3, 16. For who provoked him when they had heard? Who provoked the Lord when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, well, to those that were disobedient. So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. And then into chapter 4. Therefore, let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard Exodus shows us the early stages of Israel's disobedience in the desert. And most notably, we're going to witness their rebellion at the mountain when Moses descends with the law. And they are busy worshiping a calf, of course. But it's helpful for us to remember that this generation of Israel is described in Scripture as an unbelieving generation. An unbelieving generation of Israel. And as a result of their unbelief, they are not permitted to enter the promised land. And we know that this promised land is symbolic in Scripture of the kingdom to come. That the real kingdom, as it's set up in the future with Christ reigning, is located in largely the same place on earth. And in the meantime, that place, that place of Israel, is always considered the 
the picture of, the lesser of, this greater coming fulfillment. So this generation pictures the rebellion of unbelieving Israel. So at the end of this chapter, we see two things. We see God at work saving for his namesake, and we see a people who are showing some troubling signs. They are not fully there in the sense of their faith and their obedience to God. They've already shown some rebellion. They'll show yet more, of course. And yet they've witnessed tremendous things, things that most people will never witness. Further proof of what Jesus teaches in Luke 16, in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, in which both Lazarus, the poor beggar, and the rich man who owns the majestic house die and enter into the afterlife. One is in a place of torment. One is in a place of comfort. And as the rich man in his place of torment wonders how he can do something to help his brothers who are still alive avoid this same fate, he asks Abraham to send Lazarus back, resurrect him, in other words, and bring him back to life and send him back to his brothers, knowing that since his brothers lived in the same house, they had looked out that gate and seen the same man, Lazarus, all those years, they would certainly recognize him when they see him again, knowing he had died, they would be impressed by this miracle and would have something to think about. And Abraham's response is, that won't help. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, Abraham says, which is to the word of God, then they will not be persuaded even if they see someone raised from the dead, which was prophetic of how Jesus' own resurrection would not influence the belief of the Pharisees. The point being, miracles, even very remarkable worldwide famous miracles like the Red Sea, do not substitute for the spiritual change in the heart that can only be done by the Spirit of God. Faith is not created through sight, but by hearing the Word of God, Paul says. It's a reminder to us that as we endeavor to seek the belief of others, to encourage others to know what we know and to evangelize, we cannot rely on tricks and wonders and signs and miracles or even, to that extent, testimonies of such things in our life. Though those testimonies may have power to gain attention, they cannot bring a faith that it comes along only by the Spirit of God through the Word of God. So now we go into chapter 15. We will have more to say about the unbelief of this generation and how it materializes in rebellion, certainly as we get to the mountain where it becomes more evident. If you wish to go further than Exodus in your own studies, you'll see plenty more of this in the book of Numbers, of course. It comes to a climax in chapters 13 and 14 of Numbers when the nation is put out of possibility of reaching into the land. But from here we now go into chapter 15 which is set in exactly the same moment, that is, the moment immediately after the army of Pharaoh is swallowed up in the sea. It's referenced in passing in Psalm 106, 12, when it says they believed in his words, they sang his praise. That's a reference to the song we are now going to study in chapter 15. This is a song that is sung. This chapter will complete the third section of the book of Exodus. And chapter 16 sets up the next stage of the book. This is the people of Israel finishing their escape from Egypt. Now, we know they're amazed at what they've seen. No one could help but be amazed at what they just witnessed take place in the water. But under the influence of the Spirit, Moses and Miriam, who is described in chapter 15 as Aaron's sister, but then again, Aaron is Moses' brother, so she's also Moses' sister, we assume. So Moses and his sister are influenced or led by, inspired by the Holy Spirit to compose and presumably sing a song of praise to God, but it's also a song of prophecy. So tonight we get a chance to study it from both points of view. Chapter 15 is dominated by these two songs. It's really the whole chapter for the most part. The two songs are typically called either the Song of the Sea or the Song of Moses. And the second one is the Song of Miriam, very short compared to the one of Moses. These are victory hymns. They are sung to celebrate the Lord's victory in this moment. To this day, these hymns are still a part of worship in many synagogues because they are understood to be the formative moment of the nation of Israel. In much the same way that we would sing songs of the Revolutionary War, or at least remember the war in songs of patriotism, these songs play a similar role in the mindset of the nation of Israel. This is their equivalent to Washington crossing the Potomac. This is their equivalent to the Boston Tea Party. This is, this is when they became a nation, if you will, in a sense. Though they were formed under the man Abraham and then later Isaac and then finally Jacob, they came into a national identity as they exited the nation of Egypt. These songs are a form of poetry 
Hebrew poetry. And as we study them tonight, we're going to have to understand how you understand or how you look at Hebrew poetry. So you're going to get a little bit of Hebrew lit today. Let's start with that before we begin to read the text. Uh, Let's compare it to Western poetry for just a moment. Uh, Western poetry is primarily focused on the sounds of words. That's really what forms poetry. It's making sounds in the arrangement of the words pleasing. And those sounds are based on rhyme or rhythm or alliteration. Hebrew poetry works on a totally different basis. They make no attempt to rhyme, no attempt for rhythm or for alliteration. Their interest is solely on parallelism. You are a good Hebrew poet when you create very interesting parallelisms between two lines, both attempting to convey a similar thought, the second line finishing the thought from the first line. So in the way Hebrew poetry is composed, you'll see pairs of lines. These pairs are on a single thought. The first line introduces the thought. The second line, in a parallel fashion, completes the thought. Then you move to the next pair. The art of poetry, then, is in finding creative ways to express the same thought within this pairing. You'll see this throughout the Old Testament. In fact, depending on your translation, most English translations will indicate when you're looking at poetry by the way that the text is formatted on the page. So when you see that poetic format on your page, that's when you know you're in a poetry mode. That should trigger us to start looking for the parallelism. That will help us see the ideas move from doublet to doublet to doublet to doublet down the page. Now, the pairs themselves are then grouped further into strophes, S-T-R-O-P-H-E-S, strophes. So a strophe is a single topic expressed in detail by those pairs of lines. The Song of Moses has three strophes. The first strophe runs from verses 1 through 5, and there are some different ways to break this up depending on who you look at for counsel, but I'm going to tell you that I think it's 1 through 5. The second one is 6 through 10, and the third one is 11 through 18. And the song itself is prophetic. In fact, this is a pivotal moment in Scripture. This chapter is. This song is so important that Revelation 15 tells us that this is the song sung in heaven right before the bold judgments are poured out on earth and bring an end to the time of tribulation and to this age. So what does the heavenly realm choose to sing at the moment right at the very end of God's prophetic plan when this age is coming to its appointed end? What song is the song that gets sung above all others? The song of Moses. As well as a song called the song of the Lamb. Those two are put together in heaven. It tells you something about its importance in God's plan of prophecy. So obviously the prophetic meaning of these verses extend well beyond the moment of Exodus. They extend all the way until the last day of tribulation. Let's read now. We're going to read the first strophe, so verses 1 through 5. Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will extol him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea, and the choicest of his officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep covers them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Now, immediately you see the parallelism, right? And you can see the art of the poet in the way that these things are matched up. This first strophe now recounts the might of God in conquering Israel's enemy. It begins with a praise of God's fighting strength, calling him Jehovah, which you remember that name always means a covenant-keeping God. So this is proof of him keeping his promise to Abraham. He saved Israel and brought them out of Egypt. He drowned Pharaoh's men in the process and so on. Save that in our head. Let's just go next into the second strophe. The second strophe begins verse 6. Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. And in the greatness of your excellence, you overthrow those who rise up against you. You send forth your burning anger, and it consumes them like chaff. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters were piled up. The flowing waters stood up like a heap. The deeps were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be gratified against them. I will draw out my sword. My hand will destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. 
So it just progresses. God shattered the Pharaoh's army. He overthrew those who rose up. And in his anger, he consumed them. He divides the waters. He provides ample opportunity for Israel to escape. But at the same time, this escape gave the enemy reason to believe Israel was weak and could be conquered. And that was the trap that God set so that the enemy thought they were triumphant when in fact they were about to be destroyed. Now let's go to the third strophe, the final one, verse 11. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? Awesome in praises, working wonders. You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. In your loving kindness you have led your people whom you have redeemed. In your strength you have guided them to your holy habitation. The peoples have heard they trembled. Anguish has gripped the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom were dismayed. The leaders of Moab, trembling, grips them. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them. By the greatness of your arm, they are motionless as a stone until your people pass over, O Lord, until the people pass over whom you have purchased. You will bring them and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. So, to summarize this one, having destroyed Israel's enemy, Moses then asks, who is like the Lord? He's defended Israel. He's redeemed his people. And the peoples of the earth have heard of this deliverance, Moses declares, those of Philistia, Edom, and Canaan. And as a result, their hearts melt away at the news that God is fighting for Israel, and they have terror at that prospect. And then he says the Lord's people will pass over their lands, over the lands of these enemies. Ultimately, they reach God's holy mountain. They receive their inheritance in the sanctuary of the Lord where the Lord reigns forever and ever. So then his song ends with a summary of those same events again from 14, but not in the poem. Now, this is separate. This is narrative again. Verse 19, it says, For the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, and the Lord brought back the waters of the sea on them. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea. So now, before we examine Moses' song in detail, let's also note the second song, that of Miriam, Moses' sister. It's only one pairing. So it starts in verse 20. Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancing. Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. The horse and his rider, he is hurled into the sea. So the song repeats the essential theme of Moses' song, of course. Notice, though, that it's extremely short, to the point of being apparently redundant, it would seem. She's called a prophetess here. She's the first woman in the Bible to carry that title, by the way. It extends to others. Deborah was a prophetess. Isaiah's wife was a prophetess. There's others in Scripture. But she carries that title first. Prophet is a gift, not a title or an office. Teacher is a gift, not a title or an office. God can put gifts in the body of a man. He puts them in the body of a woman. They're the same gifts, the same opportunity. The way they use them may be constrained from time to time based on role, but that's not of concern here. This is a woman who had the gift to speak in prophetic terms and did so. That means this song is also divinely inspired, which begs a big question. If it's divinely inspired... God needed it to be said. Why did this need to be said? It seems to just say what we already heard. Well, in reality, she offers us something much more profound than it appears and something different than what Moses said. To examine the song properly, I first have to establish a framework for you in a context. And I warned you coming in tonight that this is deep stuff. This is giving us an opportunity to really peel back an onion on what's here on the text. And so I have to give you a framework, some construct on which we're going to hang the pieces of this onion. And as we've already noted, the Song of Moses is divided into three strophes. That's important understanding what's happening here. The first strophe, the first part, recounts events very specific to the events of Exodus, right? It mentions the Red Sea, it mentions Pharaoh, it mentions the chariots. That's a unique moment. The second part, beginning in verse 6, In that strophe, things start to change, if you notice. There is still the mention of seas piling up and congealing in the deep. So we know that Moses is still talking about the same event. But the song begins to describe that event in increasingly general terms. In fact, it starts to talk about things that could be happening in another context. Moses talks about God shattering Israel's enemy, overthrowing those who rise up against God, consuming 
Israel's enemies with burning wrath. The enemy thinking it is won when at the last minute its apparent victory turns to defeat. Those are themes, those are principles that are not unique to the book of Exodus or to the events of the Red Sea crossing. The song in the second strophe starts to look more generally at God promising to do things for Israel that aren't limited to Exodus. And then we go to the third strophe. And in the third part, it becomes almost entirely divorced from the context of Exodus. There's almost no reference any longer to the story of Exodus. It says the earth swallows the enemies of God. While God has redeemed his people, the world sees God's power and trembles. God's people meet God at Zion, the holy mountain. God resides in his sanctuary forever and ever at this place. None of that's happened. We haven't seen Canaan fearing the Lord. We haven't seen the nation of Philistia trembling at the prospect. None of these things are present moment as Moses speaks them. They're all prophetic. So the story of Moses, the song of Moses, to step back for a moment, goes in three parts. Now, in general, and in the far distant future. So Moses moves in increasingly prophetic terms as he goes through this story. We've already established how the Exodus story itself, the whole account, from the beginning on, from the time they go into Egypt, from the plagues, and now the Red Sea crossing, all of that is a picture of the end times. I remind you of that from past weeks. Remember Israel being in bondage and set free by a Redeemer? Pictures Israel in sin, being set free by faith in Christ. The Redeemer has to conquer Israel's enemies first, initially through a series of judgments poured out on the earth, at the end ultimately through the sacrificial Lamb, that being Christ in the case of the last days of tribulation. And once the nation is freed from their bondage, they are led to a mountain where they worship God in his holy residence. All of this is picturing what ultimately happens as Israel leaves tribulation and enters into the kingdom. We've already established that and we see it now clearly. Well, Moses' song prophetically is making that same connection for us. In fact, if we hadn't already seen that picture... If I hadn't brought that out, you'd be seeing it here. You'd be noticing the connection here. The first third of the song establishes the fact that God's delivering Israel from Egypt as promised by a covenant. That same covenant is the basis on which the second and third parts of the song will also be true. The same Jehovah that is covenant keeping regarding his promises to Abraham and Egypt will be the God who is covenant keeping regarding his promise for a seed will be also the covenant that God keeps in redeeming Israel and bringing them into their inheritance. One covenant, one God, faithfulness from front to back in steps, in stages. And the song is reflecting that entire picture at some level. The third strophe is the key. Moses begins in the third strophe to describe events that we know are future. That's our first and biggest clue to know that we have to see this as prophetic because those things can't be present day. Moses says that God's people will be redeemed while the world will fear and then various nations will tremble in the fear of God. Now, those events come to pass in two ways. There is an initial fulfillment, if you will, in which the nation of Israel enters into the land under Joshua. And these events of Canaan and Philistia and Edom being fearful, those come to pass. I'll give you a couple of examples out of Joshua. In Joshua 2, 8, So this is the story of Rahab. The spies have entered into the the city and Rahab has taken them in. Verse 8, Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Notice what she refers to. She says, we were all so frightened when we heard you were coming because we remember what happened 40 years ago. Verse 24, later in that chapter. They said to Joshua, surely the Lord has given all the land into our hands. Moreover, all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before us. So this is 40 plus years after Moses spoke those prophetic words. And here you see it coming to pass. So we know the third strophe is looking into the future because here's a proof of that. The future, though, must extend much further than merely these events in Joshua. 
because we're told the Lord is going to ultimately lead Israel into their inheritance to the mountain where they will find the Lord reigning forever and ever. That detail, which is the last verse of the song, is critical to appreciating how far in the future this song is looking. Because had we not had that last verse, we might have easily assumed that everything that's described in the song was fulfilled when Joshua entered the land. But by virtue of that final verse, it tells us of something that's not yet happened. Not yet have we seen the Lord reigning on earth forever and ever in his sanctuary. So that has to still be the future. If that's a reference to the future, if his reign is a reference to his future, then the sanctuary can't be the sanctuary that was set up in Solomon's day or even the tabernacle that was set up earlier than that. So the residence must be the eternal residence if it has the eternal king residing in it forever and ever. And if that's true, then the mountain on which that residence rests can't be Mount Sinai in Midian, the the mountain that Israel is led to after the Exodus. It must be the mountain that is ultimately their destination after they leave the tribulation, walk into the kingdom and find their king reigning forever and ever on that mountain. So what we learn is that the mountain that they're about to walk to in this time of Exodus is part of the picture. It's a part of showing us this pattern of you will be in bondage. I will free you by mighty powers and wonders. I will bring you away from your enemies, save you in the last moment from their wrath, come into your bring you into your inheritance where you will meet me at a mountain. That whole storyline is prophetic about a future fulfillment, which we ourselves still wait for. The writer of Hebrews confirms this picture for us very specifically on how the Mount of Moses day, that is Mount Sinai, is not the one that is expected to be the one of our future and their future, nor, by the way, is Mount Moriah the one of David's day. That also is a picture of what is to come. The mountain that is to be permanent, that is to be the residence of God forever and ever, is the Mount Zion of the kingdom. And the writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 makes this comparison for us. Now, if you didn't understand this general pattern that we just studied in Exodus... Chapter 12 of Hebrews would be important and you might gain many good things from it, but you'd miss the heart of it. The heart of what the writer in Hebrews 12 is telling us about is the picture of Exodus telling us a story about our future in the kingdom. Look what he says in 12.18. Hebrews 12.18, speaking to the church, to the believer, the writer says this, For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriad of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, But now he has promised, saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken. That is, created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. So what the writer of Hebrews is teaching is that the mountain of the nation of Israel, the mountain they were brought to under Moses, this mountain that produced fear and gloom, the fear and the dread that you'll see described when we get there of Israel facing God in that mountain was representative. Their fear and their gloom in the presence of this mountain was representative of the effect that God's law has on the condemned flesh of men. So as God sat on the top of the mountain with the law prepared to be given through Moses, and the sinful people of Israel approached the law of God, they became increasingly fearful and dread-filled and and gloomy because the sin of men is condemned by the law of God. And even though they couldn't have expressed it in those terms, in their spirit, this was the response. Much as you see when uh, an angel appears to a man, they fall on their face 
Or when God makes an appearance before men, they fall on their face in fear. That's the instinctive reaction of sinful flesh before a holy and just God. It says even Moses trembled. The good and obedient and believing servant of God trembled. But then the writer says, as believers, we have been led to a different mountain, to a different city, to a different kingdom. One of light and angels and God himself. One that cannot be touched as yet. One that has not been seen in this moment but is coming, the Zion that will descend to earth once all that has been created has been removed. He speaks of it being shaken. Once all that we see and touch now is removed, all that will remain is what is unshakable, that is the future eternity that is to be forever. That is the mountain that we are now made a part of but have yet to see. This is the mountain Moses is describing as well at the end of his song, the place where the Lord will reign forever and ever, the place where the nation of Israel will receive their inheritance. So, before the nation of Israel will enter into that kingdom at the conclusion of tribulation, we know some things must happen to them. Now, I am going to borrow liberally from the Revelation class that will leave some of you fully appreciating what I'm saying and why, and perhaps others of you sort of wondering where I'm getting this from. If it's the case that you're wondering, I hope it's incentive for you to go find the Revelation class online and catch up. I'm going to try to fill in as many gaps as I can so that you're not totally unsure of what we're talking about, but it'll be a summary at best. The tribulation comes to an end, we're told in Scripture, when the Lord returns. As he returns, he slays the Antichrist, who stands opposed to him. Then Christ receives the nation of Israel in faith, as the remnant of Israel believes in him, And with them, he ushers in the kingdom age. So Christ comes back to earth to defeat the Antichrist, receive Israel, and set up a kingdom for them. With him come the church and the saints of the Old Testament. Once the Lord has done that, he plants Israel, so to speak, in their inheritance, in the land that has been promised to them from the time of Abraham, just as Moses declares in verse 17. Meanwhile, the Lord himself sets up occupancy in a temple on Mount Zion where he reigns forever, as Moses says in verse 18. So Moses' song speaks of God's work in Exodus, but then it uses the storyline of Exodus as a picture to draw our minds to the future work of God in the time of tribulation. That method, by the way, of drawing a prophetic connection or a prophetic picture, that method is consistent with what Hebrew poetry does throughout the Old Testament. It's very common. Poetry always involves these pairs of statements, right, as we've already established, where the first and the second are connected. They they echo a similar thought. I believe Hebrew poetry was founded on parallelism between pairs because that pattern in itself is indicative of how God uses prophecy in general. He gives you a lesser and then a greater. An early view of something that is fulfilled with a later view of something. And the two together are the same thought amplified one from the next. So when I'm a Hebrew and I've learned Hebrew poetry and my my mind has sort of been wired to look for parallelism in language because that's how I think. Like your mind is, is wired to think of rhyme as poetry. In fact, your mind is so wired like that that if someone says a rhyme by accident, we say, well, I'm a poet and didn't know it. The natural connection of the rhyme just stands out in our mind and we immediately identify it as a poem created absentmindedly. When the Hebrews are trained to think poetry, they're trained to think in this parallelism. So when they're reading through their own scriptures and they see a thought and then later they see that same thought repeated elsewhere in their scriptures, but in a new way, they're prone to see the connection. Their mind has been wired by Hebrew poetry to look for this lesser to greater relationship. And that's how God uses poetry or in general how he uses prophecy throughout the Bible. So we have to start thinking like that. You've done that with me a lot in here, I know already, and we'll continue to do that. But that to me is that building block that God has done in the Hebrew language and in the Hebrew culture to then allow them to unlock prophecy more easily in Scripture. And so when they come to a song like Moses and they see how it moved from present day circumstances to things that are clearly not present but future, they immediately appreciate the parallelism. He's saying what's coming is a lot like what just happened. What I just did is to help you understand what I am about to do later. Learn from this so that you know what to look for next. And you look at how Jesus is prophetically revealed so often in the Old Testament. It's through pictures and words and thought that is representative of some greater fulfillment that happened in his actual day. 
Cursed is the man who hangs on a tree. And Jesus hangs on a cross. These are not just puzzles designed to make it hard for you to see the truth, but it's more about the manner of God revealing himself to men and finding patterns to help make that connection in our mind. So understanding Hebrew poetry is important, not just for understanding the text before us, but for getting that mindset for how to see Scripture generally when it comes to prophecy. Finally, I mentioned that Miriam's prophecy added an intriguing detail. She says the Lord hurled the horse and the rider into the sea. Now, we understand how that statement is connected to Exodus. Self-evidently, that's what just happened, right? Pharaoh's horsemen were consumed by the Red Sea. But curiously, her statement is spoken in the singular. A rider, a horse, thrown into the sea. Now, the use of the singular is our clue to understand that this statement speaks both of Egypt, but it also speaks prophetically about the same last days, those same last moments of tribulation that are also described in Moses' song. We find the answer in Revelation 6. The arrival of the Antichrist at the start of tribulation is described in this way. Revelation 6, verse 1. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it, had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now for those who were with us in the Revelation study or have studied this book on their own, you should immediately recognize that the rider on this horse in Revelation 6 is the Antichrist. This is the moment depicting his arrival on earth to assume a position of authority and power. This is not the moment he becomes king of the world. That happens at mid-trib, three and a half years later. But this is the moment when he first comes on the scene and begins to influence world affairs. This is the beginning of his reign on earth at some level. At the very end of tribulation, he is defeated by God. In the last minute, just as we mentioned, just as the Antichrist is about to crush Israel in Jerusalem, as he thinks he has his moment of victory, he, he sees victory snatched from him and turned into defeat by Christ's return. So it's just like Exodus. In Exodus... The Lord provided Israel an escape. Think about the details of that moment geographically. Israel stands on the eastern bank of a body of water. The enemy advances from west to east. God provides an escape out the back, if you will. He opens up a channel behind them, and they're able to go from their position westward, escaping away from the advancing army coming from that same direction. That army chases them and then is destroyed before they can reach Israel. The Lord fights that battle for Israel. Israel does nothing, of course, to stop the advance of the Pharaoh. All the fighting, if you want to think of it that way, is done by God. Remember, he fights among the chariots, the wheels fall off, and they recognize God is fighting for them. Okay. Let me take you to Zechariah, Zechariah 14. This is the moment when the Lord comes to rescue Israel. Israel is in the city of Jerusalem. They are under attack by the Antichrist in the very last days of tribulation. From their perspective, in the middle of this attack, it seems hopeless. But because God pours out his spirit on Israel in those days, they become faithful. They understand the truth of who Christ is. They mourn for him and they come to faith in him. And as they cry out for their Lord, he returns for them. And then in chapter 14, we hear of how that transpires. I want you to look for the parallels between how this day goes and how the one we heard described by Moses went. Zechariah 14.1, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half of the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in the front of Jerusalem. Look, on the east, so start picturing in your mind a map. Where is Jerusalem? Where is the Mount of Olives? The city is in a place. The Mount of Olives is to the east of it. The people are in the city. And from which direction do the Antichrist forces attack the city? From the west. And then his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in the front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split. Look at this. A channel, almost like a walkway. The Mount of Olives will be split in its middle, and the split runs from east to west by a very large valley, 
so that half of the mountain will move to the north and the other half toward the south. I wonder when they're walking through this valley, if they look to the left or if they look to the right, will it look like the earth has been piled up in heaps on either side of them? And then it says, you will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. And in that day there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle, for it will be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night. But it will come about that at evening time there will be light. And in that day living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, the other half toward the western sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. And in that day, the Lord will be the only one and his name, the only one. So Miriam says back to her song that the rider and horse will be hurled into the sea. The word for hurled is literally the word cast, as in cast into the sea. And the sea, the sea is often a picture of hell, of the abyss, of judgment the inky depths, the bottomless pit, the judgment of God. That's how Hebrew poetry is often perceived. You can see that very clearly in places like Jonah and elsewhere. So with our knowledge of how these pictures are commonly used in Scripture, with our knowledge of Moses' song and how that connection to the end times has already been given to us, we take Miriam's song and we set it in that same context. And what we find is a description of the writers, not only of Exodus, but prophetically a writer the Antichrist being hurled into the sea, into judgment in that future day in connection with Israel fleeing and saved by God through this supernatural salvation, supernatural rescue. That's why the final judgments of tribulation are prefaced in Revelation by the Song of Moses. Look what's said in Revelation 15.1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb. The song of Moses being sung at this moment is our final confirmation that what God gave Moses to say, he wants us to remember here now as you watch these very events at the end of tribulation begin. So God was speaking to the nation of Israel about events so far and distant from their present situation they couldn't possibly have grasped them in the moment, I would argue. But he's left them in Scripture for us and over the centuries for everyone to understand what would be coming and to see his faithfulness play out not in one moment but over a whole plan through Scripture. Now, before we leave the song, I want to show you something even more interesting about this account. In the story of Exodus, we noted that God made clear he was judging not only the people of Egypt, but remember those plagues, they also judged the gods of Egypt. And we went through how each plague had some connection, remember? So each plague was designed to be an assault against some god, some pagan belief, And by that assault, it would render it impotent in the minds of the people. And it would elevate God to where he deserved to be, that is, the one and only God. We also noted that God changed the calendar for Israel. He changed it, if you will, 180 degrees, an opposite from where it is, six months out of phase, out of cycle. When he moved the calendar six months out of phase, he took it away from the constellation of Libra, the scales in which the pagan culture believed that our Entrance into the afterlife would be determined by a weighing of our good and bad on a scale of some sort. He moved it six months out of phase to a month of the year that was under the constellation Aries, that is the sacrificial ram, in which God makes clear that, no, it is by my sacrifice alone that you may enter into the afterlife. So in all these things, in the way he dispels the belief in their gods, changes the calendar, all of these things are intended to do the same thing. They are intended to put to rest any myth of the pagan world and to elevate the truth of who God really is. This makes sense when you consider how little Israel knew of their God in the day of these events. They had the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob repeated down the line to them, but no scripture that we know of had been written. And their 215 years in Egypt had probably done a lot to bring into their culture a lot of pagan thought and belief. And God is purging all that as he brings them out. 
In the songs that are sung after the crossing of the Red Sea, there is one final pagan myth that is being destroyed. And that's what we want to look at as we finish this part of the chapter. First, a little background on the culture. There is a cult that is well known in the, in the scriptures. You'll see it appear throughout the Old Testament. The cult of Baal, B-A-A-L. It was the basis for most all Canaanite religion. All of the Canaanite peoples that occupy the, the land that Israel is about to go live in. Most of their pagan beliefs centered around this single cult of Baal. Baal is the god of Canaan. His name literally means Lord. The Hebrews always considered Baal to be the false god of this world, i.e. Satan himself. In fact, in the New Testament, the word Beelzebub, meaning Lord of the Flies, is the term for Satan. Lord of the Flies was a way of demeaning Satan's title because flies are attracted to dung. And so he's the Lord of Dung is really what that meant. So the Canaanite religion, where Baal belief began, had a false mythology concerning how the world came into being, the creation of the world. And that false creation story, that mythology story of creation, was centered on their god, Baal. This myth begins with Baal and another character in their mythology called Yam, Y-A-M-M, Yam, they, they are in a conflict, they're in a struggle. So as their creation story opens, you have Yam and Baal in conflict. Yam, which is a word in Hebrew that means sea, is defined as this sea of confusion. It's a formless, chaotic sea. Formless and chaotic is the way they envisioned Yam. While Baal, on the other hand, was a force of order. And Baal was threatened by Yam, so Baal and Yam contend with one another, Baal conquers Yom and thereby setting up the rest of creation. He then takes ownership over creation, he has dominion over creation, and he starts to set things in order. Having conquered him, he sets up a kingdom. Baal sets up his kingdom on the earth. He sets up a palace, and then from that palace, Baal will reign over the entire earth, according to the Canaanite myth. This story was central to pagan understanding of creation. We see it as a myth. We understand its mythology. They saw it as fact. It could be compared to the myth of evolution today. So as common as the myth of evolution is, as commonly accepted as it is, as widely believed as it is, so was this myth in the day of Moses. So they believed in this Yom versus Baal creation story. Now you can recognize Satan's fingerprints all over it, can't you? Remember, Satan is a liar. He has nothing original in him. He's the father of lies. All he knows how to do is take what God has in truth and pervert it and create some counterfeit of it. So he hasn't got an original idea in his head, but he's filled with ways to take the truth and distort it. So you can see his counterfeit tactics in this myth, which he brought to the Canaanite peoples. Notice Baal is Satan. Baal was the good guy. Baal was the guy that found order out of chaos, while this formless and deep void, which we recognize as the beginning state of creation, according to Genesis 1 and Genesis 1-2, that he poses as the enemy, as the thing that needed conquering, the creation. He conquers the creation, Baal does. He begins to reign over it, setting up his kingdom here. And all of that reminds us of his work in the garden, that as he stole dominion from man through the sin that he brought about, he then took ownership over this creation. So it's feeding his story as God, but all from a counterfeit point of view. So how does this relate to the Song of Moses and the Song of Miriam? Well, Moses' account reads like the Canaanite creation myth, only in reverse. If you were to read this song in Hebrew, you'd be struck by two things in the Hebrew language. First, the word in Hebrew for sea is yam, and you would see yam showing up throughout this account. So throughout the narrative, the poet explains to the reader that Yom conquered God's enemies. Yom swallowed up the enemies of God's people. Yom was the one who was victorious in this account. Yom not only destroys God's opposers in Israel's day, but Yom will also destroy the Antichrist in a future day. He will be swallowed up as well. Second thing you'd notice in Hebrew is the concluding statement in verse 18. It says, the Lord will reign. In Hebrew, this is Yahweh Malach. Yahweh Malach. In the Canaanite religion, there was a celebratory statement that was often a part of Baal worship. 
like you and I would say Hosanna or Hallelujah. They had a similar phrase, but their phrase was Baal reigns and it was Baal Malach. So the end of this is Yahweh Malach. It would have sounded like someone took your common mantra and turned it in a new direction. Now, while the story of Exodus is first and foremost a story about Israel leaving slavery, from the Song of Moses, knowing a little about what was in the present culture concerning Baal, we can take all these pieces and we can see that the story of Exodus is also a creation story in the sense that it is the story of the creation of Israel as a nation. The Song of Moses, then, is written in such a way that it testifies to the superiority of God's creation in contrast to the mythology of Baal's creation. It's defeating that myth in the same way that it was working against the gods of Egypt and against the calendar. Now, that connection is not going to be readily apparent to you and I, especially in English, and that's understandable. But the construction of the poetry, the carefully chosen Hebrew words, and the way this fits with what we know was culturally the belief of the time sets us up to see this story from a creation point of view. The God of Israel is the creator. He has all the power. Baal didn't destroy Yom. Yom will destroy Baal, so to speak. Now, since this song starts to introduce a bit of creation thought from this one point of view, it leads us to another pattern. And this is my favorite part, the last thing concerning the song. The first creation story in Genesis, you have the world created being formed out of water. In the Exodus story, you have the nation of Israel being created, born, as it were, out of the water of the Red Sea. In fact, the Red Sea is widely understood to be seen as a picture of a baptism for the nation as a whole as they come out of the sea. In our personal relationship, in faith, we are, by faith, made new creatures in Christ, having been born again through the baptism of spirit and water. In the final days, the nation of Israel is born again in faith, residing in a kingdom that has flowing rivers of living water. Each of these moments is a triumph of God over Satan and his forces. Further supporting that creation motif is another connection to the Sabbath. After the six days of creation, in the first account, God rests. After the Exodus account, God will command Israel to rest for one day. After our personal salvation, we begin a rest in our Sabbath, Christ, and we rest in him perpetually. And after the nation of Israel is saved, that world then enters into the eternal rest of the kingdom. Each of these Sabbaths is greater than the one that preceded it, the last being the fulfillment of all that precedes it, Christ being at the center of it. So we're going to look at the issue of the Sabbath much greater when we get to that part of this story when God pronounces that in the law. So, to summarize the songs of Moses and Miriam, Moses and Miriam spoke as prophets. They declare the mighty works of God in Egypt and in times to come. They testify to God's defense of Israel in Egypt and God's defense of Israel in tribulation. They spoke of Pharaoh's defeat in the Red Sea and Antichrist's eventual defeat at Christ's return. And furthermore, the poetry is constructed to carefully invite comparisons to Canaanite mythology. And with that comparison opens a conversation around how these creation moments all follow similar patterns. We'll have more to say about those symbolic connections in the future, but for now I think we've done enough on that. Let's finish the chapter. Verse 22, Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea. They went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Then he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. There he made for them a statute and a regulation, and there he tested them. He said, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, am your healer. Well, a brief summary is all we need here, and then we'll pick up again next week because we're beginning a phase here that you can see is different than what we've been looking at. They're, they're beginning to move out now. After the crossing, they travel westward into the land of Midian. Three days of travel, we're told. But in those three days, they've yet to find water. That isn't surprising. We talked about this area before when we looked at Moses when he lived there. It gets less than an inch of rain a year. It's a terribly dry desert. And at about this point, they reach a source of water. But that water, we're told, is bitter 
and undrinkable. And bitterness in Scripture usually indicates foul or even poisonous. So they can't drink it. It's not about taste. It's about healthiness. They can't drink it. They call that place Mara, which means bitter. And that same name is used, as you know, in the book of Ruth when the woman Naomi says, I'm so bitter, just call me Mara. So the people begin to grumble, asking Moses, what are they going to drink? It's remarkable that the nation would find cause to grumble so soon after the crossing. And here you see that spiritual truth playing out that we mentioned earlier. If you had any doubts concerning my conversation or my teaching on who they are and their heart, you don't have to go far in the text to see it starting to play out yet again. Even after witnessing great signs and wonders, the people are still hard-hearted. And that's evident in the reality that they're not trusting in the Lord here. They're doubting. Their very question indicates doubt that there will be water. The mind, folks, can be influenced by what we see and experience, but the heart, the spirit, cannot. So Moses asks God for relief, and God gives Moses a solution, throwing a tree into the water, and it will become drinkable. With that solution, God, through Moses, creates this new statute, he calls it, or regulation, and a test for the people of Israel. Because they are sinning so readily after having seen the Lord deliver them, with that sin comes rules and regulations and tests. This is all just a foretaste of what's going to come. So I want you to see the connection. They sin. God provides for his namesake. But as they sin, he brings law and rule and regulation to test them. Because with sin comes law. Not as a means of salvation from sin, not as a means of addressing the heart or the root of sin, but as a means of revealing sin, of reflecting the, the truth of the heart. So God directs that if the nation would heed his voice, do what is right, keep all his statutes and commandments, then they will not receive the Lord's judgment. Well, they're not going to do that. No man can. If Israel does anything other than obey everything, then they will receive all the judgments. God says he is the healer of Israel which means I'm the one who can turn bitter into sweet. Ultimately, this is the story of tribulation in Israel. Remember out of tribulation, what brings Israel into the need for a tribulation in the first place? Their inability to keep all of God's laws and statutes. What follows for them because of that? All the plagues like what he gave to Egypt, the plagues of of the tribulation. In the end, what is their rescue? What is their solution? God, he is their healer. This requirement is repeated in the law, of course. This ends the third section of the book. This sets up the new theme, which we now pick up next week, the theme that runs really through the rest of Exodus and through the remaining books of Moses, if you really trace it all the way until Deuteronomy. And that is, the nation that left Egypt is unbelieving, yet God saves them for his own name's sake, but that unbelief brings them to testing God time and time again. And after ten tests, God then puts them out from the promised land but yet the nation is still destined to be saved by God's grace. And to show them their unbelief and sin and to cause them to seek after him, God gives the nation nation laws and statutes which reveal their sin and also foretell the need for Christ. We begin chapter 16 next time by covering this final verse of 15, which I did not cover tonight intentionally, so we'll pick up there next week. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for the depths of your word. Thank you for... In our, in our weakness, Father, thank you for the grace to find these truths and to appreciate them. And as we see these things revealed, Father, we come, so, come away so amazed at who you are and of your wisdom and skill in the words that you've given men. Let that increase our faith as we look to you in everywhere we go in life, Father, not just as we study your word, but in the everyday of our lives. Let us remember a God who can orchestrate such things over a millennia of time can also accommodate our needs one day at a time. We pray this in faith and confidence and hope that we would return next week to continue. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.